Is it backup? Is it data lifecycle management? Is it data protection? Is it data management? Today, we're going to talk about all of those topics. everybody, welcome back to another Future Tech video podcast. The audio version of the podcast is now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most of the others. Or you can find it at futr.buzzsprout.com. In 2008, Veritas employees Jaspreet Singh and Malin Barate got together to create the data protection company Druva. Here's a fun fact. In Sanskrit, Druva translates to North Star. For years, they built the business around endpoint data protection, but the product evolved into a more enterprise-focused cloud data management company. Last year, they completed a Series E for $130 million with a valuation north of a billion dollars. Today, we have Druva's surprisingly technical CFO, Mahesh Patel, with us to discuss the importance of SaaS-based data protection, where the market's headed, and what's happening with Druva. Welcome, Mahesh. Thanks, Chris and Sundish, for having me on. Appreciate it. Awesome, awesome. And as usual, Sundish is here with me. Tell me a little bit uh, you know, about why you guys feel SaaS is so critical now, right? Um, you know, we're, we're in, the, in the land of pandemic, in the world of pandemic, um, and you, know, you guys are, are really um, breaking through right now. And, and, and it seems like you're, you know, you've got a product that's timed well for the market. Can you speak to, to like why, why it's so timely now to have a, a SaaS-based product like you do? Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, I think the, the world's evolved, obviously, in the last seven months plus. Um, this was a much harder conversation, I'd say, five years ago when we went to a cloud-only model, a cloud-native model. Uh, because often enterprises didn't recognize that infrastructure and cloud was, was a viable way of doing business. Um, now, over the last five years plus that we've built our platform and scaled it, um, bandwidth constraints have been alleviated, cost points have been improved, uh, and now, you know, doubling down with COVID and the whole world changing, how they're, the whole world's going to work from home culture. The, the view of building, uh, racking and stacking bigger data centers and getting even access to your data has become a problem. Uh, layer on the fact that governance, compliance, privacy risks have also kind of compounded the entire issue. When you think about the fact that, um, you know, whether it's a right to be forgotten or, or, um, you know, just having access to your archival data, just having data fragmented in disparate locations, it's, it's a broken process. And, you know, this, this world of COVID kind of made the epiphany for many organizations and many enterprises to think about how to really think about how you manage and most importantly, protect your data. Um, and so this has been an interesting journey, but I also think why we do it from a SaaS point of view is really the fact that uh, when you think about the dynamics of building out a solution, um, it's not that every enterprise has a, you know, 20% cloud organization or team, you know, a cloud operations management team. Every organization generally lacks the DNA to understand how cloud management happens. And, and I say that in the sense of, if you look around, there's upwards of 10 to 15 startups out there just doing cloud management. And what I mean by that's the uh, likes of cloud health, Batchly, cloud checker, and if, if it's so easy and simple to get to cloud, you wouldn't need this breadth and depth of solutions just to do cost management and management your cloud resources. Um, so it, it's a DNA that's required. Um, and at the same time, enterprises, as they've shifted from your typical perpetual or your on-premise models, have shifted to SaaS because the simplicity, the ease of use, the lack of capital requirements uh, to build this and scaling. So, uh, you know, I give the example of why, you know, BMC you know, was disrupted by ServiceNow. It's not that it was, why didn't BMC become SaaS company over time? It's just the fact that it was, it's, it's a skill set. They had needed to build a company and it, it, it takes a long time. And we took six years to build this platform. And, and uh, you know, you know, Bar- it took a, uh, a pandemic to kind of make us a little more relevant, but I think <laughs> this is not a, a story that's going away. Cloud adoption's only accelerated. Uh, you know, I think Satya Nadella said in two months, there was two years of digital innovation and transformation here. We've seen that. And, mm-hmm. you know, adoption of Office 365, um, mobile workforces, everything. So um, so we think it's here to stay. And, uh, and uh, we have a, you know, we're in perfectly positioned to take advantage of it as well. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, um, there was an article I read recently about the fact that for the first time, cloud infrastructure spend has outpaced uh, on-premise infrastructure spend. 
which is really, really, really telling. And, you know, means, you know, you're very well positioned for what's coming next. And I think, you know, when you look back at the evolution of data protection, you know, which we used to call backup, right? Um, you know, it, it was this big kludgy on-prem complicated expensive solution but the thing that's really interesting i think about what's happening now is and 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 i I have to admit when we first saw how all the changes happening in the data protection space i didn't quite grasp where all this was coming when i started seeing you know this this sort of you know SaaS based backup kind of option becoming available and you know the reality is now that you look at more stuff is being put into the cloud than on-prem, it shifts that dynamic because it makes sense to have a box on-prem when you've got a lot of stuff there locally and that's where you're dealing with everything. But as everything starts spreading out and you go into the cloud, it makes a lot more sense to put the backup in the cloud then, you know? And that's what I think is sort of the interesting uh, shift that is so compelling about all this stuff, right? No, absolutely. I think the proliferation of cloud applications alone, uh, whether it's your Office 365, your Salesforce.com, G Suite, Slack, Box, uh, the proliferation of that, the remote offices, the, you know, I would say somewhat gone as the world with the world of the monolithic data center. I don't think uh, everybody's looking to build, you know, giant data. There's going to be obviously some industries that are dominated with, with uh, large data centers, but I think the capital requirements, the know-how, the focus on the racking and stacking, more capacity utilization, things, high compute hardware, it's kind of gone because the utility model actually creates an environment where it's so easy to use. And again, to your point, when your solution is sitting where the cloud, where the data is, it makes no sense to take cloud data and bring it back to on-premise. And that's why the proliferation right. of the story goes so well. Yeah, I mean, and, and you, the, the other thing you mentioned is SaaS, right? All these SaaS apps. I mean, we, we've, we've got uh, one company that Sundish and I work with, and they have over... 2,000 different SaaS applications that they're working with, right? And so, like, you know, and the thing is, is that people don't always realize is that, you know, your SLAs might vary drastically from what the SaaS company's SLAs are, right? Mm -hmm. And having good backups of all that stuff can be, one, very challenging, but two, extremely necessary, right? Um, And so I think that's another big part of the dynamic as well. No, absolutely. And, and I think the dynamic of the SLA, the understanding of what you need to do with that data, repurposing, purposing it for, let's say, legal hold, forensics, compliance. Um, you know, these SaaS companies were not built for backup. They were not built for repurposing that data for alternative uses. Um, so right. they may, you know, it's not a question of uptime. I don't think you're backing up whether Office 365 goes down overnight. The, what you're really backing up for is the compliance governance uh, use cases, but also user intervention. If a user goes in Mm -hmm. and your most critical, you know, your accountant deletes 60 lines from a spreadsheet that's so critical to you, um, and you, you know, go three months later not recognizing this, who has version control? Who has access to that data? Do you have that? There's a ransomware injection somewhere. Who has this data? You know, it's proliferate throughout um, who's maintaining copies. And you somewhat want a Switzerland of data protection. You don't want to buy, (laughs) you know, data protection from every application vendor because it becomes a kludgy process. You need to centralize as more fragmented your data is, the more centralized your d- data management needs to be. So Druva came out of sort of more the endpoint data protection market, right? And, and, and uh, you know, has evolved over the years to be this more enterprise-focused uh, SaaS cloud, you know, company. Um, you know, th- take me through that evolution a little bit and, 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 you know, tell me, like, you know, what was the problem you guys saw in the market and how you're approaching that problem and trying to do it better than all the other products out there? Sure. So, uh, you know, we attacked the endpoint use case first, and it was just because it was more adept to cloud. Uh, that data had yeah. already left your data center. You know, when we think about six plus years ago, it was already out away. It was uh, that data, that was corporate assets, corporate data sitting in a Starbucks working. Um, and, you know, <laughs> making sure that was being protected uh, and then providing governance right. and compliance on top of it was really critical. Um, and so you saw that become a c- easy, relevant viewpoint for my uh, CIO understanding. I, I need to back up this data for my governance and compliance use cases and it, frankly for availability as well. But then layering on the fact that, um, you know, it was already outside your data center. They're ready to move forward to that. The evolution has come over time that, you know, the next piece was now cloud applications. Data is already sitting in the cloud. So adapting a SaaS solution already in the cloud made sense. Um, and now with the data center, the, the world is kind of where, you know, I, I say this often is that, uh, you know, there's 
nobody's graduating college and saying I want to be a backup admin when I grow up. Um, so <laughs> if, if that's the case, um, you know, this is a skill set that needs to continue to evolve over time. And, um, you know, so it's, it's something that people are lacking the skill set around this and having more, building more hardware, more software, more perpetual, uh, you know, solutions in on premise. You're just compounding the issue that eventually you're going to need to think about how you scale your organization. And, uh, you know, this is non value add at the end of the day. Do you want to be an expert in backup? Leave it to the professionals and, you know, leave it to the folks who, frankly, who built a scalable solution to scale. And that's, um, really what we, uh, we take advantage of at this point. Yeah, I mean it's it's rarely a core competency of yeah. any company <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to do backup well, right? Um, well, it's usually you when know, you, get in uh, when you call the backup admin, right? And that's it. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, right, exactly. That's and then right. they're a the hero. And, yeah, other, other than that, they're, they're, you're just happy if they show up to change the tapes, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, so one of the things that uh, you know you, you talked about a little bit too is sort of you know the the kind of consumption models for you know buying these things and one of the things that we've seen is a big shift um during these this covid crisis is everybody has been really cash flow focused right um and i'm and i'm sure you know being a cfo you you understand that very well right now um and so what we've seen is um you know this is one of the reasons why SaaS has been really nice because it tends to be more consumption-based models and you know the big rise that we've seen especially during this pandemic has been this concept of everything as a service right um, you know, obviously you guys are well positioned to offer something to, you know, kind of keep everybody's cash flow happy. Um, can you, can you talk to like what you guys are doing on that front, what you're seeing out in the market? Sure. So, uh, you know, we see the evolution of SAS. Um, I, you know, sad to say, I think SAS is somewhat becoming, uh, the old world, we're old world now, all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> saying everybody went to SAS yeah. in the last few years. The next model that's coming up is the utility based consumption model. Uh, you know, you've seen the yeah. likes of Snowflake, who, fran- frankly, if you look through their S1, don't fundamentally mention SaaS as much, you know, because they've kind of said, we, yeah. we're, we're at the utility model. We're not li- locking you into solutions and keeping you on it for years on years and, and stacking it. It's, it's what you use is what you get. We, we aim to add value. And if we can add value, we will, you, we will pay to pay to currently. Um, and that's changing the mindset of how enterprises think about deploying their service and their solutions because, you have to live with your customer. You know, you have a customer success department now all of a sudden making sure that if backups fail, you know, you need to be living with that customer and dealing with that. You know, the old world way of dropping off an appliance and saying, uh, here, I'm going to, you know, 30% professional services, install your, your appliances and, and uh, you know, hope you're okay. And, you know, eventually call us up if there's a problem. Um, that doesn't live anymore. We, you know, we have to maintain uptime durability guarantees um and we have 24 by 7 support and customer success people living in there these are just the investments that we make on, on supporting our customers so that evolve evolution has just changed the way business models are and because of that um mm-hmm. and we offer a less you know not capital intensive so having to buy what you use makes it a lot easier for enterprise to grow and scale into new services and applications rather than walking in and saying that you need to buy you know one million dollars with some hardware and, and half a million of software to get your data center up and running. It's just somewhat of a, yeah. it's, it's not happening anymore. It's and a tough nut to swallow. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and then you think about the way to selling, um, you know, in this environment, uh, you can't step foot in your yeah. office, you can't step foot in your data center. So if that's the case, uh, you know, we're able to show you a backup done in 20 minutes over the phone. And, you know, yeah. that, that's the world. That's what we have to make it show that it's so seamless, easy to use and readily available and scalable that uh, you know, this is how enterprises are going to be used to buying kind of on a, on a go forward basis. Yeah. You know, the other thing I really like about the SaaS model is that <clears throat> when I look at companies out there, the companies that are focused more on SaaS based products evolve faster because mm-hmm. the software development yeah. model is very different. You don't mm-hmm. have to, you know, maintain multiple versions of things. You don't have to make sure they run on all this, you know, hardware. You, you, you know what your environment is. You update it. You can do continuous integration, continuous development. You can be agile. All those things can kind of plug into it. And, and that's why I think what's really interesting about so many companies these days and SaaS companies is the rate at which they're adding features and new functionalities and expanding their API. Um, it, you know, can you, can you speak to, you know, how, how you, you guys work with regard to that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you think about, uh, you know, the, whether it was the hardware model or the perpetual software model, the legacy model, you know, you're talking about six months release cycles at times. Um, you know, yeah. we at one point had two week release cycle. 
we were, we were putting features, functionality every two weeks. You know, over time, as we scaled, it's now a three week to four week, but still, nonetheless, we're, we're talking about monthly. You're getting additional features, additional functionality, improvement of, of improvement of capability and functionality, but what are we building out? But now layer on the fact that we are, we are public cloud native. So when Amazon yeah. or Microsoft launch a new tier of service or let's say uh, a new compute instance with, you know, high, highly performant, we immediately deploy that in our environment and immediately our, our customers get the benefit of a more performant solution at the same price point. So, you know, every day, yeah. every month, we're getting better, not only because we're on development, but we're on the best in class public clouds who are continuing to evolve. So that's why, you know, having that legacy appliance that, that was, you know, the nice, sexy box that was sitting there a year ago, all of a sudden it becomes arcane and less than a year later. Yeah. So... So tell me a little bit about like, you know, what, where do you see, what's your sweet spot in the market? Like, where do you find your best use cases? What kind of, what kind of companies are, are the ones that, you know, are going to get the biggest advantage for, for what you guys have to offer? Sure. That, you know, the best companies that take advantage of our solutions are the most distributed. So as you're more distributed mm-hmm. and more centralized, you really want to have your management plan to be. So with one central pane of glass with us, you're able to manage, you know, all of your remote offices, all of your uh, cloud applications all of your endpoints. And if you have any cloud workloads, you can maintain them and support them with us as well in terms of if you're already adopted AWS and how you manage the data. So one platform, as your data sprawls, you're able to manage it all in one location. Um, and then layer on the fact that not only dis- distributed environments are actually adept at uh, adopting our solution, but also um, more data, long-term data retention requirements. So companies who have data sensitivity, whether it's your pharma, your hospitals, your more HIPAA-oriented organizations, generally have long-term retention requirements where Retaining data in a, on a tape uh, drive that's sitting in somebody's closet, uh, you know, and then now having to reproduce that data, it's not happening. And and frankly, GDPR, the California Consumer Privacy Act, it won't allow you to do this anymore uh, just because you're going yeah. to need to show that you've disposed of the data appropriately. It's no longer just your primary data. Your secondary data needs to be treated the same way. Yeah. So, so you know, tell me, uh, you know, you mentioned regulatory and compliance things. You mentioned GDPR and things like that. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, some of the use cases and, 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 you know, success stories you have around that and some of the features functionality that you can bring to bear on that front. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think in terms of the compliance and governance, you know, we have, um, we, we sell in packages, <laughs> our, our solutions sold in, you know, your basic backup. Uh, we have back, backup and governance and backup and governance and compliance. That's kind of the three ways to kind of mm-hmm. peer it out the, our solutions. Um, so we actually do a legal hold through our backups and we integrate with some of the top e-discovery vendors in the world. So therefore, you know, when you think about the old, where you, old world, world was your legal team maintain a separate copy of that data for, for legal hold purposes, for requirements. Now with a single copy of data, with an API structure, you're able to immediately integrate with our, your, um, your e-discovery vendor. Reducing the amount of data that's being called for e-discovery purposes, reduce the amount of copies of data for storage use cases. So we immediately provide an easy-to-use solution for legal enterprises to think about data protection for um, for leveraging data protection for legal hold purposes. And now we'll take that forward in terms of compliance. Um, you know, we have a solution that actually, as the data is being ingested, has algorithm-based um, kind of searching of, of that data, will allow you to understand that if you're a HIPAA-compliant organization. Is my accountant keeping social security numbers um, you know, or any, any PII data on spreadsheets? It immediately allows data yeah. to use cold and understand through your backups. Because while their solution is already there for primary data, secondary trade is going to be treated the same way. So, you know, we have uh, exam- many examples. Actually, some of the Fortune 500. Uh, we have 50, 50 of the Fortune 500 as customers today. And um, pretty much 75% of them all use our legal hold capabilities. So that's the big value proposition mm. of how to take this and make a holistic approach of how you approach legal hold through your backup, backup and uh, data protection use case. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely a, a tricky and cumbersome uh, area for a lot of, a lot of companies because it's, you know, like keeping in, in traditional backup solutions, you know, maintaining those legal holds and all that was just a hot mess usually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and reporting on all that was, was quite challenging as well. Um, you know, so one of the other interesting things I think about, you know, doing data management in the cloud too, is that, you know, you, you've got a lot of companies that, you know, we talked about, you know, the big shift to the cloud now, right? But, you know, that's, that's, that's a work in progress for a lot of companies, you know, they're starting off on-prem and, you know, they're, they're, they're 
starting to utilize cloud resources, I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting about products like what you you have is that that can be sort of a gateway to helping, you know, migrate to the cloud as well. I mean, can you talk about what, what goes on in, on that front as well? Sure. I mean, um, any enterprise who's thinking of eventually migrating their primary infrastructure to the cloud, the first thing that needs to move is your backups. Um, obviously, you know, yeah. you do not want to have your primary infrastructure ready, but your backup not ready. So backups need to go first. So we are somewhat yeah. of a, you know, a gateway solution to getting to the cloud um, as you think about leveraging this and, and migrating to the cloud. So so we have solutions, whether you're you're maintaining your data on premise, a fraction of your data on premise or in the cloud, um, we can support you in both environments. And that's why it allows enterprises the transitioning. Uh, we have many, many customers who say, you know, look, I, I hope to be 100 percent on AWS one day. Today, I'm 50 percent. Uh, we're able to support them in both environments. Uh, I, obviously, yeah. it's a challenge yeah. for these enterprises just to maintain their primary infrastructure in two environments. But their backups through one simple pane of glass are able to be managed. And that's kind of the beauty as these customers transition. We're able to support that whole, whole transition over time. So how how uh, how um, distributed is your your uh, platform? I mean, you, you're on AWS. Are you doing Azure? Are you doing GCP? Do you do different regions? Is that something that you can bake into uh, your contract? Or how, how does that work? Sure. So uh, you can actually leverage um, approximately 20, I believe, availability zones through, uh, through AWS. So... We're in uh, Frankfurt, Mumbai, um, Singapore, um, Japan, Brazil, and all throughout the United States and Canada as well. So we're, we're sp- spread globally. We use all of AWS's availability zones. Uh, we are actually uh, hosted on AWS. It is a go-to-market uh, cloud partner of choice. Um, and so that's uh, our position there. Um, we, we may contemplate other clouds over time, but that we think uh, we have a great solution with them and or continue to take advantage of all the availability zones and access they have to customers globally. Um, so, but as a customer, you just you, you deploy your solution, you select your availability zone, and you're deployed. It's as simple as that. And so, it's not no no PS required. It, it's up and up and running, and backups done in whatever uh, whatever uh, location you choose. And to your point earlier about GDPR and data privacy, um, you know, if you are a you know foreign enterprise who needs to maintain your data in a sovereign location. This is an easy way of doing it as well. You know, if you're in India, you want to maintain your data within India's border. There's a Mumbai data center. That's where we keep your data, and we don't transition the data outside of it. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're going to pick a, a cloud provider, you know, AWS is the 800 pound gorilla yeah. in that space with the most availability zones in most <laughs> regions as well. So, um, yeah, I, I can see I can see why you go down that road, and why so many others go down that road as well. Mahesh, I got a question for you. Sure. So the last time that the first time we spoke, uh, we were just talking about just the evolution of of Druva, and uh, you know I, I remember using Druva backing up my laptop right mm-hmm. back at uh, the data link days. So we had talked about now all of a sudden you guys are in the large enterprise, and now you are you are in many you know a lot of our customers in the in the Fortune five hundred. Um, it's interesting for me now for twenty years you know selling infrastructure and a lot of storage and backup. From a uh, perception perspective, Druva in the market is not who many people drew, think Druva is. You know, the new Druva, who you are now, is completely different than you know what the perception might be for many customers. So how has that how has that been for you, and how do you how have you been able to overcome that? Because all of a sudden we see you guys popping into so many of our customers. You know, yeah. um, it just it, you, but you, but I never really saw you in the large enterprise. No, that's fair, and and I think um, you know, as mentioned earlier, so we started with the most, the workloads of the most adept cloud, which was endpoints, and and that was uh, you know we found success there. Uh, frankly, we're the number one player in that space. Uh, uh, frankly, we don't see a competitor that really can compete within that in that space. But we recognized we solved the hardest problem, which was uh, you know we had a. 100,000 employee organization in triggering a backup all at once across all locations because of file we sent. You know, doing the deduplication at the process, you know, storage management, doing all of that. We started the hard, hard, solved the hardest problem early on. And now with more centralized, more data, data center use cases um, and cloud workloads, they're more centralized. It's actually a lot easier for us to ever support this. And, and we're doing it at a cost point that's significantly be- great, better than we've ever been able to do because obviously cloud prices have continued to decline. And we pass those savings right back down to the customers. So over the years, uh, just the viability of bandwidth issues, um, cost mentioned, the, just the perception of cloud has Im- improved. 
Um, and we are continuing to evolve on this. And this is an area where, you know, we have, um, we're approaching almost a thousand customers just on our data protect on our data center solution. Um, you know, we didn't, we had zero effective three years ago. So to, to show you the trajectory that we're on, um, we're seeing uh, strength across that entire platform, across our entire base. And um, to your point of how are we kind of addressing this is the platform story, frankly. Um, when you think about the breadth and depth of what we can cover from your endpoints, your Office 365, Salesforce.com, G Suite, Slack, to your VMware, mm-hmm. your Hyper-V, your NAS, your SQL, your file server environment, or your data board and cloud, we can cover it all with one pl- holistic platform. So when we go to customers, we don't necessarily pitch a point solution anymore. And that's really been a change mm-hmm. of the motion over the yeah. last two years. And now we have upwards of uh, 25% of our entire customer base um, that are on cloud workloads using two or more workload protections from us. So we're becoming effectively a platform. We have a, a company that actually just went public about a month ago, uh, uses us for data center, all their data centers use us for their endpoints, use us for Salesforce.com as well, and Office 365. So we've become the platform of choice. And this is actually a company that just went public on a very successful IPO just, uh, I think, three months ago. Um, to give you kind of case in point, what's happening. It's an evolution mm-hmm. where I think CIOs were saying this is an interesting conversation, but maybe for a later date. And I think COVID's changed that entire conversation because yeah. they need to yeah. accelerate that vision, that transformation to the cloud. You know, so so one of, one of the interesting things about... Um, you know, SaaS companies and, and leveraging, you know, cloud-based infrastructure is that, uh, and, and this was sort of uh, Snowflake's value proposition. We saw how Snowflake did <laughs> like a crazy good IPO, yeah. right? Um, you know, one of the things that they always said was that, you know, they can get, uh, you know, efficiencies because of their scale with the cloud providers that, you know, an, an individual company couldn't necessarily get. Um, in terms of efficiencies and, and, and cost savings uh, on there. Um, I got to imagine that you guys experience, you know, you, you must be buying a ton of Amazon resources, right? So I got to imagine your opportunity to leverage that into a more efficient spend model is is pretty significant. No, you're absolutely right. So uh, not only do we get, you know, obviously economies of scale, being able to continue to purchase, at, you know, in volume capacity. Um, but the other element of this is that, you know, we get to, do our reservations. You know, AWS required reservations in terms of how, how much compute you're going to use, how much database you're going to be utilizing. Um, we were able to do that across our, you know, 4,000 employee cu- customer base, right? So we have the peaks and valleys. Our standard deviation of how much somebody's using is not met on a certain single customer. It's over over our entire 4,000. We know the usage patterns yeah. of our customer base. So we're able to understand how much to reserve and optimize for those costs that, frankly, anybody starting in this space trying to build a SaaS solution or a customer trying to do it on their own is going to struggle to have the cost competencies that we can have. We use spot instances, um, you know, so we have opportunity and we have a cloud, cloud team who just dedicated to optimizing our cloud, uh, not only for cloud, uh, for cost, but for performance at the same time. So we get advantages here that, frankly, um, it's going to be hard for anybody to really, you know, hit this level of scale um, over time. Over time, it may may happen, but it's just going to take a long time to build. Um, as mentioned, we have 50 of the Fortune 500 in our cloud. Um, I don't think many could say that, you know, in our in our industry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, and I think that's the one thing that everybody always underestimated is, you know, it, it it's actually a very it's a full time job for probably a team of people to manage to AWS's costs and and to optimize that to focus on optimizing those costs is really challenging because yeah. there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's all sorts of arbitrage games and things like that that you can play too. Um, and so having, you know, that kind of um, skill set within your organization is really challenging, which is why I think, you know, SaaS is a more attractive way to get to the cloud for a lot of companies rather than sort of building everything on your own in an infrastructure as a service sort of capacity, right? Um, so, you know, I, I can see that being an attractive component for a lot of people. Uh, absolutely. And I think the DNA of cloud is, is something that a lot of enterprises lack. So getting simplicity, ease of use. Um, you know, I, my prior organization, I actually worked at uh, Ring Central, uh, so one of the cloud voice mm. uh, innovators there. Mm. And, uh, you know, they it was the same concept. It was the world was dominated with PBX boxes in on-premise. Uh, you know, you could and you had your resident expert who knew how to use a solution. But if he wasn't there or he or she was not there, uh, you know, your telephone system's not working for the day. Um, and that was the the mindset. And often you're competing against the Cisco, the Via, Short Tails, um, and now you're seeing the bankruptcies across that that segment, and you see Ring Central almost hitting a billion dollars in revenue. 
um, because yeah. you know it's not that the the quality of his voice was you know leaps and bounds better. It was the breadth and depth of solutions that you can do in the cloud, the simplicity in design, and the cost point. And that's really what's happening in this space as well at the same time. Now, nobody has a team to focus no, on backups alone anymore. Um, you know, Gartner calls them versatileists now, no longer backup admins, because they're going to need to do more with the, with the people. People need to do more with the data, yeah. whether it's tiering the data, whether it's um, understanding what data you can actually delete even over time versus keep letting data yeah. proliferate. So these are, that's what we want to enable our customers to be able to do is understand their data footprint rather than just continue to keep a graveyard of data that's just never accessible. Yeah. Well, so, you know, you know, we talk about the market and, um, you know, this is, this is, it's been a really interesting market mm-hmm. over time. I and mean, because we had these legacy vendors that just, you know, dominated the market for many, many years. Right. And then, you know, the disruptors started hitting, you know, and the first sort of big disruption I think was, um, you know, like with the, the, uh, cohesities and the rubrics coming in and, you know, kind of simplifying the game, kind of like what pure, uh, you know, nimble did with the storage market, you know, they kind of came in and, and did that with, with sort of the on-prem thing. And then, you know, now there's, there's this next wave, which is sort of these, this cloud-based data mm-hmm. management thing that everybody's pivoting towards. Right. Um, where do you see this market going? I mean, it's been through, you know, fits and starts yeah. and ups and downs and it's all over the place. And and everything, every time I think, you know, sometimes when I go like, well, there's nothing more to come in the data protection <laughs> yeah. right now. And then something next, you know, comes out and it's like, wow, okay, it's still going strong. So, you know, wh- where do you see this market going? Sure. So, you know, I, I, I think uh, just as evidence about these IBM, IBM shifting into a cloud arm and, and an on-premise arm, uh, you're seeing this game play out because, you know, we, we think at scale, that even the data protection space, it's a big market. You know, we're talking about tens and twenties yeah, of huge, billions of dollars. Yeah. So it's, it's a huge market when you factor in storage, archival, all the data. Um, but you're seeing this evolve and you're seeing the legacy players in general being donors to the market. And who's captured it over the last few years is the upstarts, where it's the rubrics or cohesities uh, over the last two, three years, because they had the next sexier appliance. They were able to transition from a legacy to a solution in a hyper-converged environment, but it's still an appliance. Um, and that was the mm-hmm. world. Now, what these companies are doing, is, you know, whether it's the rubrics and cohesies, are having to extract their software and trying to figure out a way to deploy it in the cloud. Um, and that's what's going to happen next, which is that kind of evolution where enterprises mm-hmm. are not going to want to maintain more hardware. And what's going to happen in the industry is that it's going to transition from just data protection to data management. Because no longer are you going to think about just protecting your data, because that's what you trusted your data domain appliance for, which is backup. You know, you're not going to think about managing solutions that the way. You're going to want your data protection and management of that data over time to be able to build in a solution. And backup's a three-hour problem. You utilize you do backups over three hours in the evening, and you want to bring your cloud up and bring your cloud down. That's why it's right for cloud fundamentally. Do you want to buy a high compute box uh, that's sitting there and idle for, you know, 21 out of the 24 hours and then use use at this point. This is why you're able to use things in utility model. So the whole world's changing because we'll start thinking about how do you tier data? How do you think about um, you know anomaly detection in your data across your backups? Uh, whether there's insider threats happening, data exfiltration, whatever it goes on over time. And then as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the privacy, governance, and compliance of data, this is all going to become one holistic stack. And you're going to need to do this in cloud because as your data gets disparately treated and you need to have compute brought up and down, utilizing a high compute environment on premise will never work. And so it needs to evolve again and become a cloud native solution. And you're going to see that happen with pretty much every player in our space. Um, but, you know, I, I think that one scale matters. DNA matters. Uh, every one of these players, um, you know, even though IBM is going to be spinning out a cloud arm, they're still going to need to figure out how to sell and, you know, really be a cloud solution, right? It's going to take them time because they've been a legacy solution for so many years. And even the upstarts in the space, you see uh, even, you know, Nutanix, which is a company we definitely admire, um, is making a shift to a cloud model, shift to a SaaS model. Mm-hmm. And it's been, uh, it's been brutal. You've seen it in the, in the uh, you know, public markets. Uh, but it's still an amazing yeah. company and will continue to grow, but it's a hard thing to do. And it's, I think there's often a view that we just have to build it. When you get to cloud and you do SaaS, it's not just building. You have to build a solution on everything distributed and everything performant on that three-hour problem versus a 24-hour problem. You got to build it uh, for international as well and under a single cloud, which is not what most of the industry is built on. And then layer on the fact that they, now you have to operate it. 
And, and you know, we alluded to earlier about the cost management. Um, this, you know, the cost management we do compared to the rubric cohesity we're doing for so long, which was, you know, how do I get the best supply chain and get the cheapest hardware from Supermicro as fast as possible? Uh, that's that's right. a different world. And then now layer on the fact that we have to we do um, your uh, security as well. So we have a SOC two, a HIPAA compliance. We are the only data protection service that's actually GovCloud um, certified. I mean, sorry, um, um, FedRAMP certified on GovCloud as well. So these are all long poles in the tent that everybody has to come to, mm-hmm. and now figure out how yeah. to actually sell the solution, enabling your sales team to yeah. understand to sell a SaaS solution. You know, whether it's frankly even your comp plans. Um, you know, building a, a ACV based comp plan versus a a, a kind of hardware based uh, model. It's changing these companies. And it's going to take them many years to get to. So um, this whole yeah. industry is going to evolve, but we think you know, we somewhat have we've skated to where the puck is headed. In that uh, vein, you know, of what where the market's going, what's next for Druva? What 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 do you guys? And I know you can't get into you know too many details about your roadmap, but you know if you want to throw a few out here, it'd be good. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, so what what do you got planned for the future? Where do you see your your, your product going, your services going, your platform going? What's next? Sure. So, uh, you know, we've, you know, we've been waiting for this environment where we think about the fact that uh, we think the world needed to think consider cloud as the way to manage infrastructure. I'd argue probably six years ago, we were a little early for the market. Um, and, you know, I'd say about two years ago, we'd say probably 10 to 15 percent enterprise truly had infrastructure in the cloud. We think that's quickly jumped up to 25 percent now of the entire market you're thinking about. And there's still a long way to go. Um, in terms of this, yeah. we think we're in the third inning of a 15 inning game here in terms of how, <laughs> how this is going to play out. So, uh, you know, we're building an enduring company. We, we have, you know, best in class churn. Our customers don't leave our platform. They continue to deploy. We have best in class net retention rates as well. Uh, you know, we publicly announced about six months ago, uh, I want to believe about six to seven months ago that we are north of a hundred million dollars in recurring revenue. Uh, and our recurring rev, our cloud recurring revenue is growing north of 30% as well. Uh, at the same time. So, um, you know, we're doing exceptionally well, but we have this opportunity where, you know, we were an endpoint, a cloud application company, and now, now a data center as well, and an entire platform. So the platform story is proliferating quite well. Um, and so, you know, we, we see this journey to continue to build out an enduring company to be the best in class data protection company out there, no matter where your data lies. It's either data centers, your SaaS solutions, your endpoints, or your, your cloud infrastructure that you adopt. You know, yeah. I, I would say that that's what we're seeing in the market too. So kudos, yeah. kudos to you guys, right? Because when I, what I enjoy about you guys is when I say the word uh, Druva, which apparently is a Sanskrit word, uh, which I didn't know. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, for that one. Um, but but what I enjoy is like getting that customer's response because I'll say, hey, have you guys been looking at Druva? They might say, oh yeah, the endpoint backup guys. Yeah, I know we, we're looking more for you know our cloud or backup for these other applications. And it's my opportunity to do a little education and say, well, actually, you should take a new look at this company, right? The good news is your bones are already there. You're, you're a functioning organization. You're global. You're established. You have customers. You have support. You have engineering. You have all of those, those parts of an organization. I'm really interested in seeing where you guys go. Um, you know, getting in the enterprise is going to be, uh, I think, tough. But I think for you guys, it's more perception than it is anything yep. else. And and if we can help people better understand your value proposition, um, I can see you guys. Uh, and, you know, fifty Fortune 500s now. You know, I can see you in almost every Fortune 500. Um, it's just going to be the execution and how serendipitous that you get this whole COVID thing that just ma- yeah. you now all of a sudden you know. SaaS is king, and you know you have a lot of things that are are helping you, uh, you know, go in the right direction. So good for you. A lot of nice, a lot of nice tailwinds. And, and you, you hired maybe one of the best human beings I know, Brian Getz. Right. I mean, how do you how do you, how do you get a guy like him? You know, I love that guy. So I'm so happy you guys hired him as a new VP of corporate sales. That he's awesome. You know, so him. when he when he and I were talking about it, I'm like, when he's like, hey, what do you think about Druva? And I'm like, call me tonight. You know, let's, I want to talk about this. You know, I was excited. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. We're, we're lucky to have Brian too. It's, 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 it's an amazing journey. And uh, I think, as I mentioned, we're still early. We still have a long way to go. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, there's not, we're not opportunity limited. The market, the tailwinds are in our favor. We just got to execute. Yep. Yeah, you got a lot of things going for you. And, and not to mention the fact that, you know, now what you're really stepping into is sort of an annuity business model. And I mean, as mm-hmm. a CFO, you got to be like, 
Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> that makes life a lot easier, a lot more predictable, yeah. a lot, you know, a lot comes oh, together know, when you've got an annuity uh, kind of thing going on. That's, that's uh, it's a CFO's dream to get the recurring revenue models in place. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, while, while the COVID environment's been tough, um, you know, this environment sometimes a CFO's advantage because everybody becomes a lot more frugal uh, in these environments. <laughs> they, I don't need to tell them to spend less in this environment. They, they do it. But uh, the beauty of our market is that, you know, well, if, if many enterprises in our spaces were, um, were struggling to have supply chain challenges or customers buying this environment, when their revenue dipped, ours continue to grow because we're a recurring revenue annuity model. So we're actually yeah. deploying more capital in an environment where everybody else is tightening their belts. Um, and we're yeah. deploying more capital with to our channel partners, uh, to, towards our customers, to building our solution stronger while everybody else trying to figure out how to pivot their model. Yeah, well, and as, as you said, I mean, like on the one th- hand, it seems like all the work from home is m- actually made companies and people more productive which is nice and you also have you know no your travel budget has disappeared <laughs> you know? yeah. so that, that's got to be that's this, these are all you know plus the, all the other headwinds we talked or tailwinds we talked about before you know it's got to be a good time to be a cfo at uh, Druva. absolutely <laughs> <laughs> i understand you guys have a user conference coming up do you want to talk a little bit about that Sure, appreciate it. Um, so on November 17th, uh, we are holding an event um, named uh, DXP. Uh, it's a data science protection. Um, and uh, it's a half-day event um, with which is focusing on cloud data protection, what's happening in the industry, the changing environment, the way to manage your data better. Uh, we'll have some industry luminaries speaking. Uh, we have speakers from Zoom, VMware, Chipotle, uh, enterprises across the board will, will benefit from the advantages that we, uh, we can bring to the market, but also just happening what's, what's happening in this space over the next three to five years. Uh, so I look forward to having you join us. Sounds like an awesome time. So, uh, you know, and Chipotle is in there too. I think that's <laughs> Zoom and Chipotle. You put them both together. That's kind of an interesting, <laughs> interesting mix of companies. I kind of curious to see where the similarities lie be- among them, right? Well, they all have data. Um, <laughs> It's all, they all have data. They all have a ton of data and they don't know what to do with it, right? Um, well, Mahesh, I, I really, really uh, appreciate you coming on um, and sharing your story and talking about Druva and, you know, letting everybody know what what's up with you guys these days. And uh, I think it's a really interesting story and we're really excited to watch where you guys go. So good luck with everything and, and thanks so much for joining. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, click that like button hit that subscribe button. That helps us tremendously. And if you want to get notified when we post new content, click on that bell icon and I will see you in the next video.